Hello, everyone. Welcome back, Conflict Skies and Steel. What you're about to hear today is not a theory, not hype, and not a movie-style exaggeration. It's a quiet reality that unfolded while the world was busy watching missile launches, drone strikes, and frontline battles. Russia didn't need to fire a single missile to reshape the balance of power over the Middle East. It didn't need shock and awe. It didn't even need to announce what it was doing. By the time analysts began connecting the dots, the sky itself had already changed, and the most dangerous part is that many decision. Makers still don't fully understand how or why it happened. Stay with this until the end, because the final implication of this strategy raises a question that should worry every Air Force on the planet. From the outside, everything looked ordinary. Military cooperation agreements, joint exercises, defense expos, radar installations labeled as defensive upgrades, advisors rotating in and out of regional bases, nothing dramatic, no mass deployments. No headlines screaming invasion, but power in modern warfare doesn't always announce itself with explosions. Sometimes it arrives disguised as routine logistics, a radar here, an electronic warfare unit there. A data link upgrade, a training program that quietly integrates foreign systems into local command structures. Piece by piece, Russia wasn't building a wall, it was weaving a net. A net that didn't stop at borders or coastlines, but stretched across airspace, frequencies, and decision loops. Inside this system, and this part is crucial to understand, so pay close attention, the structure is deceptively simple. Long. Range early warning radars feed continuous data into centralized and semi-centralized command nodes. These nodes don't just see aircraft, they analyze behavior, speed, altitude, emissions, and intent. Electronic warfare platforms sit alongside them, listening, recording, and learning. Over time, patterns emerge. Which aircraft fly where? Which drones transmit on which frequencies? how often certain corridors are used. This interior layer doesn't need to be large to be effective. It needs to be smart, connected, and persistent. And that's exactly what it became. Now here's where performance reveals itself in a way most people miss. The true performance of this system isn't measured by kills or interceptions. It's measured by hesitation. When regional air operations began to slow, when flight paths quietly changed, when drones vanished from radar feeds, not because they were shot down, but because operators lost confidence in what they were seeing. Pilots don't need to be hit to be defeated. They only need to doubt their instruments. Commanders only need to question whether their situational picture is complete. Once doubt enters the loop, decisions slow, windows close, and opportunities disappear. That's exactly what happened. Airspace didn't become closed, officially. It became contested psychologically. Electronic interference surged at moments that mattered most. Sensors degraded without explanation. Data links lagged or dropped. Systems that had worked perfectly in training behaved unpredictably in real operations. And the brilliance of it was that nothing could be conclusively blamed on Russia. No debris, no radar tracks showing interceptors, just interference, ambiguity, and uncertainty. That uncertainty is the weapon, and it's far more powerful than a missile, because it doesn't provoke immediate retaliation. It paralyzes instead of enraging. Safety in this context isn't about protecting civilians. It's about protecting the strategy itself. By staying below the threshold of open conflict, Russia avoided triggering the automatic escalation mechanisms that modern militaries rely on. No casus belli, no clear red line crossed, everything remained deniable, a malfunction here, atmospheric conditions there, local operators blamed, software glitches cited, and while officials debated explanations, the system kept running, collecting data, refining models, and tightening its grip. This is what modern safety features look like in hybrid warfare, 
not shields, but excuses, the unique power of this approach lies in how it reshapes relationships. Countries hosting or integrating these systems gain protection, but lose autonomy. Over time, their air defense and surveillance become dependent on Russian updates, Russian technicians, Russian doctrine. That dependency doesn't require political alignment to be effective. It only requires operational reliance. When your air picture flows through someone else's architecture, their priorities begin to matter whether you like it or not. And for adversaries, the selling point is even darker. You don't know where the edges of the system are. You don't know which radar sees you, which frequency is being watched, or which action will trigger interference. The battlefield becomes opaque. Another layer most people ignore is how this affects stealth and advanced platform. Stealth was designed to defeat individual radars, not distributed sensor ecosystems. When multiple systems share data, weaknesses overlap. A track lost by one sensor may be picked up by another. Even partial detections, when fused, can become actionable intelligence. That doesn't mean every stealth aircraft is suddenly vulnerable, but it does mean the margin for error shrinks. And when margins shrink, risk calculations change. Missions that once seemed routine become politically and militarily expensive. The cost of building such a system isn't cheap, but compared to maintaining carrier groups, deploying large expeditionary forces, or sustaining prolonged air campaigns, it's remarkably efficient. The real price isn't financial. It's strategic. Control over airspace has always been the foundation of modern power projection. When that control becomes contested without visible conflict, traditional deterrence models begin to fail. You can't deter what you can't clearly attribute. You can't retaliate against ambiguity without risking escalation on false assumptions. As this system matured, something else happened quietly. Russia positioned itself as a mediator by default. When you influence the sky, you influence escalation. You can calm situations or allow pressure to build. You can quietly signal tolerance or intolerance. That gives you leverage far beyond the physical footprint of your forces. It turns air defense into diplomacy by other means. And once regional actors realize this, their behavior adapts. Requests become negotiations. Coordination becomes dependency. The sky stops being neutral. Here's the part that should really make you pause. None of this required secrecy in the traditional sense. The equipment was visible. The agreements were public. The exercises were announced. What was hidden was the intent, and more importantly, the integration. Modern power doesn't hide assets. It hides connections. And once those connections are in place, removing them isn't just a technical challenge. It's a political and operational nightmare. You can dismantle a base. You can expel advisors, but unwinding years of integrated data, doctrine, and reliance is something else entirely. And now, we reach the question that ties everything together. If this model worked in the Middle East, a region crowded with competing air forces, foreign bases, and constant surveillance, where else can it work? What happens when similar networks appear near major sea lanes, contested borders, or strategic choke points? What happens when control of the sky becomes something you lose gradually without ever realizing the exact moment it slipped away? This isn't about Russia alone. It's about a shift in how power is exercised. Missiles still matter, jets still matter, but the real battle now happens before takeoff, before targeting, before authorization. It happens in data fusion centers, in spectrum control, in confidence and doubt. And the side that controls those invisible layers doesn't need to fire first. It can wait. It can watch. And when the moment comes, it can decide whether anyone else flies at all. If this video changed how you think about air power, then you're starting to see the battlefield the way modern strategists do. The most decisive victories no longer arrive with explosions. They arrive with silence. 
and once that silence settles over the sky, breaking it may cost far more than anyone is prepared to pay,